part of the session. This is in a sense an elaboration on what I spoke earlier, but just from a different framework. Prabhupada said that when philosophy is presented from different perspectives, it we can understand it better. So one point I talked about was try to be grateful instead of feeling dissatisfied or resentful. So now, okay, but how do we move forward in our lives? Another way of looking at it would be say this this is based on uh, what do we do that's what i talked about so this is based on an acronym called tab so in every situation that we are in either we can blame the situation or blame people blame ourselves or blame god blaming god bhakti siddhant said thakur said is like spitting at the sky <laughs> <laughs> What happens? <laughs> I spit falls on us only. <laughs> so, what has happened has happened. We can't do anything about it. But now we can blame or we can take responsibility. What does take responsibility mean? Take responsibility means I am in this situation and what is the best that, can, that I can do in this situation? Taking responsibility make us better. At least we become better and it can help us to make things better now how do we do this this one way to take responsibility is by treating ourselves as someone we are responsible for now what do I mean by this treat yourself as if you are some someone as if that is someone you are responsible for Many times when, when I had that TB, my doc, I had to take almost like a one year treatment uh, and the doctor told me after four months, all your symptoms will subside. But please don't stop taking the medicines because the germs are still there and if the germs are not removed, then you will, the TB will come back and that is called RTB, resistant TB. It's very difficult to cure. So they used to tell me that when India TB is still quite widespread, so they have social workers who go to people's houses and, uh, I mean volunteers, who go to people's houses and make sure, remind them, have you taken this medicine, have you taken this medicine? Mm -hmm. So, it, to simply to take medicine also requires responsibility. And many people don't take medicines. Not just in, in it's not just in say, illiterate country, you could say not, not, India is not illiterate, but say a third world country, India is also becoming now progressive, but it's in the first world also, people don't take their medicines. Now, it's so much so that, Sometimes people get a, people who have dialysis. A dialysis is a very painful process, you know, draining the whole body and it takes hours and hours. And after a long time, if people get a kidney transplant. Now when the kidney transplant happens, at that time, the body, because it's a foreign body coming into the body, the body doesn't accept it. So some medicines have to be given so that the body does not treat the new kidney like a, like a predator and damage that. So those, if those medicines are not taken, then the kidney is damaged by the body itself. Now that now people have gone through painful dialysis for months and months, maybe years. And after years of wait, they have got a kidney. But, and after that, all they need to do is take the medicine. But almost 30 to 50% of people, the kidney transplant fails because they don't take the medicine. Now, why is it that people are so irresponsible? But curiously, researchers have found that people are more responsible. Say in the Western world, I mentioned one of the earlier, I was in LA for a morning walk and we went to a park. Normally in a park, you will see some parents, some children playing. But this whole park was filled with dogs. In, the, in, the, in America, especially among the Caucasian families, the number of pet dogs is more than the number of children. So, why I am talking about this is that you know, if people's dog is sick and they take the dog to a vet, people, are, people make sure that the dog takes the medicine, but they don't take their own medicine. No, no. Is it crazy? Yeah, we could say it's crazy, but actually, this is very, very deep point over here. The deep point is that right? actually when we feel responsible for someone, mm -hmm. that brings the best out of us. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. When we, so, they, if they feel responsible for their pet, that, that makes them responsible, make sure that the medicine is taken. So similarly, you know, if, if a couple has children, then both the parents become more responsible. Now there's a child here, we have to take care of that child. So be, taking up responsibility actually brings the best out of us. It, it, fosters, a, it fosters a sense of commitment. It brings, so, so we could learn to take responsibility for ourselves. That means treat yourself like you are like someone you are responsible for. So how do you do that? Suppose you had a friend. Say, suppose we are in a particular situation. Maybe uh, we got some disease. Maybe we are going through some relationship issue. Maybe we are worried about our job. So we are going through some issues right now. Suppose you had a friend who was going through those issues. And that friend sees you as a guide. So you feel responsible for that friend. So what would you do to help that friend? What would you make sure that the friend doesn't do? So treat yourself like you are someone you are responsible for. So take responsibility. Now what can we take responsibility for? Now our situations in many ways are not in our control. But we can take responsibility for some things. Three things, no matter how bad our situation is, three things are always in our control. And we can take responsibility for these three things. They are this, our thoughts, our attitude and our behavior. So this is the acronym TAB. So no matter how bad the situation in our life, we can open a new TAB. We, our situations don't determine what we think about. Our situations don't determine our attitude. And our situations don't determine our behavior. I'll explain this. But actually the whole process of Krishna consciousness is essentially about tapping these three things. So, uh, what does it mean by taking, uh, our, our taking responsibility for our thoughts? Let's look at this. We may say, if I have a problem, I have to think about the problem. What can I do about it? I mean, you say that I'm free, my thoughts are free, but no, my situation is so bad, I have to think, I, I, I'm going to lose my job. I have to think about my job. What am I going to do? Yes, we have to think about it. No doubt. But there's a difference. If we look at our thinking process, how it works, Say on the y-axis is the clarity for solving problems and the x-axis is the time we spend on thinking about the problem. So it is not a straight line going up. When we have a problem and we don't think about the problem itself, that is a big problem. We have to think about the problem. How do I deal with it? Isn't it? So and as we think about the problem, we start getting more and more clarity. So the graph moves up, up, up. But after a particular point, even if we think more about the problem, no clarity comes. <coughs> we start becoming saturated now. Think about it. And not only does the, the graph attain a plateau, uh, but after that, it starts dropping. Then the more we think about the issue, then the more worried we feel, the more drained we feel. Overthinking is a big problem. Not thinking is a big problem, but overthinking is also a big problem. What happens sometimes, some people say, initially I was confused. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> what that meant is that, you now I'm not even sure whether I'm confused. <laughs> so we can just get lost in our head. So what happens is we do need to think about our problems, but we think constantly thinking about our problems itself becomes a problem. So we all need a satisfying, safe object of thought. A satisfying, safe object of thought. We all need that very much. Just like we, we need a home for our body, we need a home for our thoughts, a home for our consciousness. 
And one thing we could say is that entertainment, earlier we talked about how people are spending lakhs and lakhs of rupees for one game. Why is that? Because entertainment promises some a satisfying object of thought. Oh, my life is this problem, that problem, that problem. Just let's watch a movie. Let's watch some sports. Let's watch this. So now people are spending phenomenal amounts of money on entertainment. Uh, but entertainment, although it offers a satisfying object of thought, it is like a painkiller. When there is pain, the painkiller covers the pain. It doesn't cure it. And that is why if a person is taking only painkillers, then the dosage of the painkiller needs to be increased more and more and more. And that's how you will see entertainment, the dosage is increasing constantly. I say if you consider sports, say if you consider most of you are Indians, others also know more or less. So say about India, so uh, in the past there was cricket, but there was test cricket. So five days long matches. Then as people's boredom, dissatisfaction, irritation increased, they said, you oh, know, five days is, the dosage of the painkiller is not enough. So let's increase the passion. What happened? One day cricket. One day cricket came. And then after some time, when that was not enough. Then increase the dosage further. Then what happened? 2020, 2020. 2020 cricket came up. And actually, broadly speaking, Indians had two painkillers. One is cricket and the other is Bollywood. So about, I think, 10-12 years ago, both of them got married. <laughs> and they begot a child. Who is that? IPL. IPL. <laughs> so there are Bollywood stars and there are cricket stars all coming together. So now, actually, in this IPL, it's just like 50-60 days match or something, 50-60 days of matches. The amount of money that is spent is more than in uh, is more than what is required to feed all the hungry people of India throughout the year. So now, then I'm not criticizing entertainment here. The point I'm making is different. That why are people spending so much money? We could say they are crazy, but that's not a very reasonable explanation. It's just a label you are putting. People are crazy, but what it is is that people feel the need for entertainment so desperately that they are ready to spend extreme amounts. And that indicates how desperately they need a satisfying object of thought. What does entertainment offer basically? Something satisfying to think about. But it is it's not bad, it, but it's a painkiller. If somebody is very, very much in pain, a painkiller may be required. But a painkiller should not replace the curative medicine. So we could say entertainment is like the painkiller, enlightenment is like the curative medicine. Enlightenment means what? Enlightenment means understanding that the supremely safe and satisfying object for our thoughts is Krishna. He is the one unchanging reality. If our consciousness becomes absorbed in him, that is when we will have real security, real satisfaction. So sometimes, so we're talking about taking responsibility for our thoughts. That if we learn to direct our thoughts towards Krishna, that directing our thoughts towards Krishna itself will give us relief. That itself will give us strength. And just as people seek, when people watch entertainment, uh, they are not expecting any solution to their problems, but they just want. I want to forget my problems right now. So yes, that's a need, but today it's become an obsessive need. People are, in fact, for many people, I saw like a joke, I saw a joke cartoon and said, you know, today my Wi-Fi went down, so I spent some time with my family. <laughs> they seem like nice people. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how things have become unfortunately distorted. So the enlightenment, Krishna consciousness might seem very impact. Always think about Krishna. What is this? I have so many things to do in my life. How can I think about Krishna? 
thinking about Krishna actually gives us a relief internally. It's like say if it's it's very cold outside and we come to a heated room. We feel relief. So similarly, when we think about so many things in the world, oh, this problem, that problem, that problem, that problem. But we just direct our thoughts toward Krishna. Just think about Krishna, pray to him, chant his holy names. We start feeling relief. You start feeling calmness. So even if no problem is solved, just that relief is also sufficient. It will also give us some strength. Unfortunately, what we do is, <coughs> say, we come to the door of the room which is heated. We are trembling in the cold. <coughs> we come to the door of the room which is heated. We open the door and we wait. When will the atmosphere get warm? Mm -hmm. We don't come into the room. What do I mean by that is, we come to Krishna, but we don't become conscious of Krishna. We still stay conscious of our problems. And you think, Krishna, when are you going to solve this? When are you going to solve this? When are you going to solve this? And then if you're not conscious of Krishna, we don't get that relief. So, thinking about Krishna means, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. Tell your problems how big God is. Yes, I have tough problems, but God has taken me through much big, big problems in the past. He will help me to go through this. So when our problems are there, sometimes we think, first I have to solve this problem, then I will chant Hare Krishna. Then I will practice Bhakti. Yes, if there are urgent problems, we don't need to deal with them. But we don't necessarily have to delay thinking about Krishna. If you say, after I solve my problem, then I'll... I will I will become devoted to Krishna. That's like thinking that yeah I want to I want to swim in the ocean, but I want I'll enter the ocean after the waves stop. The waves will never stop. So actually speaking, our mental energy gets we don't spend all our mental energy on addressing problems when we think about the problems constantly. In fact, we just waste a lot of our mental energy. So if we learn to think about, take responsibility for our thoughts, that means think as much as is required to get some constructive answers to problems that we are facing, but afterwards direct the thought towards Krishna. And then by that, even if the problem is not solved, at least we will not be tired internally. Because thinking of Krishna is satisfying. Thinking of Krishna is energizing. So that is taking responsibility for our thoughts. When we do that, we will find that at least internally we will be having a source of energy, a source of rejuvenation. See, there is release from problems and there is relief amidst problems. So even if there is no release from our problems, the problem is not gone away. But if there is relief amidst the problem, at least this constant trouble is not there so much now. And that itself is a first step forward. Second is attitude. So broadly speaking, these three points, how they are related is, first what I think about, then how I look at my situation. And the third is how I behave in that situation. So actually with the attitude, I will talk a lot about it in ACE, that uh, how to be grateful and not resentful. But So I will summarize that here only in one sentence here. Life determines our problems we determine their size. So, we can't control the problem that face we face. But we determine the size of those problems. The more we think about a problem, the bigger the problem grows. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. We start being overwhelmed by the problem. So, attitude means yeah, this is the problem and then, but with Krishna's grace, I deal with it. And we use that ace, what I talked about earlier, to face that problem in perspective. We may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. This problem is there, but let me go look for the good around it. Let me look for the good that has been combated, or let me look for the good that may emerge from it. So either we can see the problem as a burden, or we can see it as a difficult phase in a higher plan for our evolution. Just like the for the bird to crack the shell and come out. It's difficult, it's painful. 
but it is essential for the bird's evolution. So similarly, when we are going through difficulties, it's a phase and it's essential for our evolution. So if we face it, we will grow by it. So if we have this attitude, so whenever we have problems, we broadly speaking have only two attitudes, two, two options basically. Oh, we can be resentful, this is a terrible problem, why has it come in my life? Or we, we can either be resentful and drag ourselves through that problematic phase of our life or we can voluntarily accept that problem as a challenge. Okay, this problem is there, let me see how can I, I can meet it. It's not pleasant, obviously, but the second approach is universally better than the first approach. Being resentful only <coughs> makes things worse, sometimes infinitely worse. But trying to be purposeful, okay, how can this, maybe this is for my growth, I don't know, what can I do in this situation? Having that attitude, voluntarily choosing to face the problem, that will, ensure, that will stimulate our growth. Then this is the last part of behavior. So we are talking about which acronym now? Yeah. 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 So we can take responsibility for our thoughts, we can take responsibility for our behavior. So our attitudes and our behavior. And now behavior means somebody might say that I am in a terrible situation. I can't do anything about it. Say if somebody has got a fracture and they are on bed. Say I am bedridden. What can I do about it? What do you say? What behavior? I can't behave properly. What can I do? I have no control over this situation. So, have any of you faced a situation in your life when you felt you were powerless? You just couldn't do anything about the situation? Yes. Has anyone faced like that? Yes. yes. Well, for those who didn't raise your hands, I don't want to be a messenger of bad news. <laughs> but everybody will face situations like that. When we feel powerless. That's just the way life is, you know. Life is tough. I've traveled across the world, I met many successful people. But you know, you just scrape a little above the, below their surface, and everybody is working through their own tragedies. You know, somebody had their child who passed away because of cancer, somebody's got a parent who is struggling from Alzheimer's, somebody has got a, going through a painful separation. Life is tough for everyone. So the point I'm making over here is. Not that uh, uh, life is tough, so we just have to suffer. The point <coughs> I'm making is that whenever we feel that we are in a terrible situation and we can't do anything about it, uh, that feeling that I am utterly powerless, that is actually a very damaging feeling. And one way to challenge that feeling is to ask a counterintuitive question. That, okay, this is a terrible situation and I feel powerless. But can I make things worse? You say, who wants to make things worse? I am already doing the terrible. <laughs> no, that's, nobody wants to. But can we make things worse? No matter how bad things are, we can always make them worse. <laughs> yeah. We are never too old to learn what? To make yeah, we are never too old to learn some new way of doing stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> of making things worse. <coughs> Suppose, say, going back to the same example. Of, say, I'm, I got a fracture in my leg and I am bedridden. Now, I am bedridden, but I can take a hammer and crack my other knee also. <laughs> now, obviously, I shouldn't. But the point is that if we can make things worse, that means we are not as powerless as we think. If we can make things worse, that means we can make them better also. That is the point. No matter how bad things are, we can make them worse and we can make them better. So we, no matter how, whatever the situation is, it's a terrible situation, but we can make it better. So how can we make it better? That is by looking at 
small things in our life. So this is, first is, this continuation of the attitude. You know, we can be fretful or we can be faithful. Mm. You know, why did this happen? Why did this happen? No, Krishna has some plan. We can be resentful or we can be resourceful. Okay, why is this happening in my life? Okay, but what can I do in this situation? What can I do in this situation? We can be resentful or we can be resourceful. Or we can be fearful or we are cheerful. Now, this might just seem to be like just play of words, but there's more to that. It's not just play of words. Let me explain. Any situation that we are in, uh, actually when we go through difficult situations, our mind tends to eternalize the present. Eternalize the present means the mind says that this is a bad situation and this is how it is going to be for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Today's problems can be dealt with today. Mm -hmm. But the, what the mind does is, on top of today's problems, it adds yesterday's problems mm -hmm. and adds tomorrow's <coughs> problems. And then it becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. So we need to know that in the world, everything is temporary. If everything is temporary, then bad times are also temporary. So if we are going through a bad phase, bad times, they are like, the dark times are like a tunnel, not a dungeon. A dungeon is where we are trapped. A tunnel is what we need to walk through. So yes, we all have difficulties and they are not easy to go through. But when the mind, the, we, are, we are building on the point of behavior. If we understand that this is a tunnel, not a dungeon, then what will we do? Start walking and keep walking, isn't it? Because this will end. This will end. So behavior means that what we do is when we are going through difficult times, unmanageably difficult times can be broken into manageable units of time. What do I mean by manageable units of time? Say it's like if I'm hungry and somebody gives me a full watermelon. Uh, how do I do? <laughs> I have to cut it. Mm. Cut it. Then I can eat it. So similarly, when we are going through a very difficult phase, that is not the time to think long term. If say somebody, is, somebody in the family has got some terrible disease, and then you start thinking, oh, what will happen to me after 5 years, 10 years? Well, that, that is not the time to think about that. At that time, decrease your working frame. Okay, for the next one day, can I just be the best that I can be? For the next one day, can I not act in a way that makes things worse? For this, if one day also feels too big, for the next one hour, can I act in the best possible way? See, right now, if you think about your own life, you can probably think of two, three things which you know you can do them better than what they are doing. So three good things which if you did, your life could become better. And you can also think of two, three good, th bad things which if you stop doing, again your life could become better. So just divide your frame of reference into short units. And okay, let me take one step forward, one step forward. So when we have that attitude, one step forward, for the next one hour, for the next one day, let me deal with the situation. And when you are able to deal with it for one day or one hour, then just appreciate yourself. Good job. Thank Krishna. And thank you, I was able to deal with this. And then move forward. So when life becomes discouraging, we have to encourage ourselves. And one way of encouraging ourselves is by setting our goal so low that success becomes possible. Now we may say, how can I set the goal low? No, we don't have to set the goal low in a permanent sense in our life, but at that time, let me just work for one hour right now. Let me do things nicely for one hour. If I do it, just appreciate it. And what happens? We can either look at it, oh, I have to, I have to slog through this for the next six months. Oh, I can't do it. Or I can say, let me do this for one hour. Good job. It's tough, but you did a good job. I appreciate it. <coughs> so when we have this attitude, we will build ourselves up. And by this, so in this, this, this another way of putting this is, 
एस 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 स्मॉल सिंपल स्टेप्स वेन वी आर गोइंग थ्रू डिफिकल्टी और वेरी डिफिकल्ट टाइम्स जस्ट थिंक ऑफ स्मॉल सिंपल स्टेप्स दैट यू कैन टेक टू मेक थिंग्स बेटर एंड जस्ट स्टार्ट टेकिंग दैट स्टेप एंड दिस कैन वर्क इवन इन एनी गुड हैबिट दैट वी वॉन्ट टू कल्टिवेट I have written about 20, 25 books, but last few years I have started traveling quite a bit, so writing has become very difficult for me now. So I used to think that maybe sometime I'll stop traveling and then I'll write, but that was never, that was not working at all. So then one day I just thought that every day I will write six minutes, at least. Of course, I'm writing on the Gita every day, Gita daily, uh, but that's different from other books I wanted to write. Now why six minutes? I just thought six minutes. Six minutes is not that big a time that I'll have to think what to write. And six minutes is not so small that I can't write anything meaning write anything meaningful. So if if I write down for six minutes, I find that I can write anywhere between fifty words to about two fifty words, depending on how nicely the thoughts are flowing. But I found that just I started doing this. And by doing some days, I write for six minutes, and the thoughts flow. And I write for six four minutes and six four minutes. And one day, just I had no plan like that. I, but I started six minutes. I ended up writing for six hours. Mm-hmm. And a very good chapter of my book, new new book on Rama, and came out with it. So basically, I found that these small simple steps, it works quite effectively. So whatever it is in our life, just plan it out. Small simple steps. No need. Sometimes we think I'll make a very big goal and I'll achieve it, and that's where that's where our ego is speaking. I want to do something which the whole world will notice. But you know, okay, even if the whole world notices, that is not necessarily going to help us grow. That is not necessarily going to solve the issues that we are facing in our lives. But small simple steps. Uh, one small simple step we could take is that let me be polite with others. Or let me just appreciate one person every day. It's very ironical how we function. That we can say that we all of us have a finite uh, politeness quota. <laughs> <laughs> that means that you know, if we can be polite with people up to a particular point, but afterwards they guess are getting to our nerves. <laughs> you know, it's like. According to scientists, there are almost ten billion nerves in our body, and some people seem to have done a PhD about how to irritate all those ten billion nerves. <laughs> so now we have a finite. If we say we have finite politeness capacity, so what happens? Sometimes we go out in the streets and with perfect strangers, good morning, good morning, we are polite. and we come back home and we are sullen and irritable with our loved ones you know the people who matter the most to us we treat them most disrespectfully and people who don't matter at all we are so courteous with them so why like that you know we just start, let me be courteous with them let me appreciate one person at a time let, let me daily appreciate one person so uh, if you want to develop a good relationship with someone Or improve your relationship with someone. Just make it. Appreciate that person. One thing every day. Or if if not one person, you think that if I appreciate one this person every day, they will they will become inflated. Then at least decide I'll appreciate one person every day, not the same person. That's also okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's also okay. But just start with something small. And when we do this, we take steps forward. We take steps forward. We take steps forward, and you'll find that. One step, one step, one step can cover a significant distance, and this is where, for taking these small steps, uh, a devotional service attitude can be very helpful. This is the concluding part of this point. That this is our last point also. That sometimes we have a plan for our life, and that's like the we are going on a street, and the streets are all lit. There are all lights on both sides, and we are moving forward. But sometimes discouraging. The devastating situations come in our life. That's like the lights have gone off. Now at that time, if all the lights go off, our first uh, reaction might be to groan, to yell, to curse. But afterwards, 
will immediately try to go to our phone and turn on our flashlight. Now the phone's flashlight does not replace the street light. But the phone's flashlight is enough for us to see one step forward. We take one step forward and then the flashlight is to another step. So our plan for our life is like the street lights. We all have expectations in our life, we all have dreams, we all have big big hopes. And it's natural, it's human to have them. But sometimes uh, those expectations get frustrated. And when that, ha time that happens, we need psychological flexibility. What do I mean by psychological flexibility? I'll explain the illustration over here. Say, we are here, the reality is here and our expectations are here. So our expectations help us to shape reality. Say for example, we have bought some land and I want to build a house like this over here. So we have some dreams, some expectation and that expectation helps us to shape the reality. But sometimes things change in such a way that it becomes like this. The expectations are here and the reality is here. So for example, suppose somebody had decided, decided I want to learn rowing. And I want to show to all my friends how expertly I row. So they go for some rowing classes, rowing practice. And then they call their friends. And they expect, they have a dream. My friends will click photos and put on social media and everybody appreciate how gracefully, smoothly, swiftly you row. And they get into their boat, they start rowing and suddenly from nowhere a monster wave comes. Bang. And now <coughs> there, is, there is no boat below them and there are no row oars in their hands. <laughs> and if they keep rowing, they just imagine they rowing. What will happen? They will drown. So at that time, the reality has changed so much that now they just have to swim and get to the land. So their expectation was nice. It inspired them to practice, to commit themselves to all that, to discipline. That's good. But if the reality has changed so much, see, we have to understand when my expectation is helping me to shape reality and when the expectation is coming in the way of my dealing with reality. So if the reality has become so different from my expectations, then attachment to the expectations will interfere with my capacity to deal with reality. So psychological rigidity means I just stay fixated on my expectations. Why is it not like this? Why is it not like this? Why is it not like this? But psychological rigidity, flexibility means, okay, my expectations are now coming in the way of dealing with reality. Let me shift. Let me shift and deal with the reality. <coughs> So when we do this, how do we do this? This psychological flexibility becomes easier to have when we understand that beyond our plan is Krishna's plan. That Krishna's plan can work through our plan and Krishna's plan can work in spite of our plan. That means even if our plan is disrupted, still Krishna's plan can keep working. That is Krishna's greatness. So, what we need to do is just stay on with Krishna's plan. Ask Krishna, how can I serve you? Krishna, I had this plan for serving you, but this plan has gone for a toss now. So, how can I serve you now? How can I serve you now? Now, even if that plan has gone for a toss because of our mistakes, some, actually Krishna's plan is so big that it can accommodate our mistakes also. That even our... our we, it's, it's actually ego to think that my mistake is so big that now Krishna's plan is over. No, Krishna's plan accommodates our mistakes also. Just like say, if we are driving to a particular destination, say you are coming for the seminar and say GPS told you turn left and somehow you turn right. Then what does GPS do? Just GPS say, you didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> GPS doesn't say GPS reroutes and gets us back. So similarly, for us, Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. And no matter what has gone wrong in our life, Krishna's plan is big enough to work through our plan and in spite of our plan. So working with our plan is like when the street lights are on, we move forward. But when the street lights go off, working in spite of his plan is like turning on the social light. 
sorry, working in spite of our plan is like turning on the flashlight. What is the flashlight? Turning on the flashlight means asking ourselves, Krishna, how can I serve you? This situation has come in my life. How can I serve you in this situation? If we have that attitude, Krishna, I am your servant and I want to serve you. Whether it is through my job, through my career, through my family, everything ultimately is meant for serving you. Then if we have that attitude, how can I serve you? We'll find that the light will turn on. We'll see one step forward. One step forward. One step forward. When Prabhupada went to America, he had no idea about how he was going to preach. He had a vision. And there will be temples all over the world. But not that he knew what to do exactly. He was exploring many things. Prabhupada, sometimes when you want to do a big program, we do publicity. We do promotion. Prabhupada had no money to do publicity. So Prabhupada adopted the oldest method of doing publicity. That was, he would himself go for long walks. And in America at that time, uh, somebody wearing saffron robes, he could be quite stood out. Of course, New Yorkers are expert at not taking notice of people who stand out. Right? Like, because everybody tries to stand out, they don't take notice about anyone. But still Prabhupada was quite unusual over there also. And but Prabhupada just, oh, wherever, wherever he would get opportunity, he would go. You know, he himself went to a bookstore and he placed his books over there. And then after a few days, when that particular bookshop person was not there, Prabhupada went again and bought those same books and wrote a very good review of that book. <laughs> so that the books will get promoted. <laughs> Prabhupada did what he could. Then Prabhupada was walking on the road once and then he saw there was a young man, the big beard walking on the other side. And that man was looking at him. So that was uh, one, he was, a, he was a Howard Wheeler. He, he later became High Guru Prabhu. So he had gone to India in search of a guru but he had not found anyone. So he was going there on the way to take, uh, take some LSD. So, he was going, actually people at that time thought LSD was a very spiritual drug. In fact, LSD is actually the acronym for, a, is a short form of chemical, but they had renamed LSD. LSD is League of Spiritual Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who takes LSD joins that league, <laughs> that was their idea. <laughs> so anyway, he was going to take LSD and he looked around and he saw Swami. He said, Am I already high on drugs? How am I seeing a Swami on New York streets? <laughs> then a truck went in between. And then he thought, if this is a, this is a trance, then the Swami will not be there. Mm. After the truck went by, so Swami was still there. Mm. And he dropped his eyes, he looked again, oh, Swami is still there. And then another truck went by. And then he saw now that Swami had stopped and was looking at him. Mm. So he was really surprised. And then again the truck went by and he saw, oh, the Swami is smiling at him. Then he started crossing the road and he came by and he was wondering, after I go through the trucks, maybe the Swamiji will disappear. Mm. It's just my trance. And then he, Swami is just, Swami is waiting for me. He says, yeah, Swami, are you from India? He says, yes, and you? He says, no, I am not from India, but I have been to India. Mm. And Prabhupada told him about his talks, and he was the first serious follower that Prabhupada got. And he had a whole group of other people who were quite serious. And his movement spread. So what did Prabhupada do? He just did what he could. Small, simple steps. He had no, no facility. Just, just go out, literally small simple and go out for walks. And he met people over there. Prabhupada said that Nachao Nachao Prabhu Nachao Simate Kashthera Putali Jada Nachao Simate Just make me dance, O oh Lord. Make me dance like a puppet. So if we have that mood, Krishna, you are my Lord, I am your servant. Please guide me how I can serve you. If we have that attitude, then we may go through many difficulties in our life. But Krishna will take us through. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this theme of opening a new tab in our life. So in the previous session I talked about cultivating gratitude. And how do we go about further? What do I do practically? So tab was, what was T? Thoughts. So when we have problems, we need to think about the problems. 
but just thinking about the problems constantly itself becomes a problem. We talked about the graph, how overthinking becomes problematic. And because people have so many problems, that's why they want entertainment. But entertainment is like a painkiller, a very expensive painkiller at that. So painkillers are good in their place, but they can't replace the curative medicine. And the curative medicine is enlightenment. Enlightenment means understanding what is the really safe, satisfying object of thought. And that is Krishna. So when we practice Krishna consciousness, essentially what we are doing is we are giving a home for our thoughts. Some, so even if thinking about Krishna doesn't solve our problems, even if it doesn't re give, give release from problems, it can give relief from its problems. Even if the outside temperature doesn't become warm, but at least if we come in a warm room, we get relief for that much time. And then we can be rejuvenated. So amidst problems, uh, don't tell God how big the problems are, tell your problems how big God is. And then I talked about A was attitude. In attitude we talked about how we are, uh, life determines our problems but we determine their size. So by seeing beyond the problem to the bigger situation, we can keep the problem in perspective. That is largely related with the A's which I discussed previously. And B was behavior. So that's where I spend a good amount of time that uh, when we feel powerless can think that no matter how bad things are we can make them worse and if we can make them worse then we can make them better also so for making them better we talked about how unmanageably dif difficult times can be broken down into <coughs> manageable units of time so instead of thinking of 10 years 5 years 1 year just think of one day or one hour when life is discouraging we need to encourage ourselves and the way to do it is by setting small goals that are achievable and in that I talked about SSS what is that? Small, small simple steps so I talked about how just writing for six minutes or just appreciating someone every day or just whatever we if I talked about in the beginning about this how take responsibility treat yourself as if you are somebody you are responsible for Talk about how people take care of their pets' health better than they take care of their own health. Because responsibility brings out our best. So if we take our responsibility for our thoughts, attitudes and behavior, then through small simple steps we move forward and whatever dark phases we are going through, they are not a, we are not a, they are not a dungeon, they are a tunnel. If we keep walking through, we will eventually emerge ahead of the, emerge out of the tunnel. And for moving onward in the steps, if the street lights go off, we need the flashlight. The flashlight is our service attitude. <coughs> Explain how that is, that we have a plan for our life, but Krishna has a bigger plan, which includes the fulfillment of our plan, as well as the frustration of our plan. So Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. Even if we take a wrong turn, he can still reroute and get us back. So uh, we can stay a part of Krishna's plan by Asking Krishna, how can I serve you in this situation? And if we keep the service attitude and keep taking small steps forward, especially Prabhupada did when he found people, when he found since interest in people just by walking around and promoting that way, eventually he got dedicated people and things spread. So whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Okay, we have a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, bro. Okay. Can I have yes? Um, I was I was wondering uh, if you uh, could um, speak for a moment on on how uh, looking at problems and dwelling on them is is, is also um, thinking and acting in a, in a mode of ignorance. Okay, yeah. Is thinking about problems, <coughs> dwelling on them, acting in the mode of ignorance? Yes, definitely. In the mode of ignorance, yaya sopnam bhayam shokam vishadam madame vachina vimunchati durmeda dhruti sa partha tamasi. 1835 Krishna says that daydreaming, fearfulness, lamentation, moroseness, all these are characteristics of the 
board of ignorance. Yeah. So when we have a problem, <coughs> it's best that we first try to raise our consciousness before we deal with the problem. Because if we are in the mode of ignorance, all that happens is that it's like we are flailing around not knowing what to do. And say somebody is injured and they are in pain. Many times if somebody got a fracture, you give them a cast. Why? Because otherwise they will move their hands and it makes things worse. So like that, when we are having a problem, often if we are in ignorance, whatever movement we do will make things worse. So it's good if we can maybe chant, read something, pray and raise our consciousness. And then we will be able to solve the problem. Otherwise, whatever we do, we will only make things worse. Okay? Thank you. Yes, Pumhan. Uh, Quickly finish. Yeah. Hi, Shambha. Uh, I think we talked that you dwell on the point of appreciating a person every day. But I, I personally feel there's a difference between appreciating and being nice. Being nice is eternal. There's no other option. But the moment I attach this appreciate a person, so I, in my consciousness I expect I to be appreciated. That leads me to in the darkness because, oh, I'm not being appreciated today. That leaves me off the balance. But what I think the best thing is that when I think Krishna consciousness, you have to be nice every time, all the time. You have to do your best all the time, irrespective of whether you are being appreciated or not. Okay, that's a good question. So, you know, we should be nice, but if you start appreciating, then what happens is that we start expecting appreciation. And then we start feeling dissatisfied if you are not appreciated. Yeah, that's true. At the same time, we can that can also happen with respect to being nice. If we are nice to others, but others are not nice to us, then that could also be a problem. So I would say two things that two are different things. Being nice is being like being courteous, being polite, and sometimes that is just ingrained in us as a culture, and we naturally do that, and it's good to do that. But uh, everybody is facing challenges in life and if we we don't know a small appreciation how far it may go in encouraging someone because what happens is everybody is struggling with their own issues and people often come to a point where they think whether all this struggle is worthwhile or not so appreciation is just a simple human way of telling people that they count that their existence matters, that they, their individuality has value. So appreciation can be very powerful. And as far as expecting appreciation back from others, it's, it's but natural that we will have expectations. But I think the challenge is where we <coughs> become attached to the expectation. So if we see that, if overall we have a positive disposition, if we are grateful and then even if somebody doesn't appreciate, it's okay. So we can see appreciation simply as a service. And there's a difference between appreciation and flattery. Flattery means actually we, we praise someone for something that we don't believe they have to get from, some, get from them something we believe they have. <laughs> that means I want to you get you I want to get you to do something so I'll flatter you. That flattery is very different. Flattery, whereas uh, appreciation is where we actually see something good in them, even if it's a small thing good, and just appreciate them for that. One way to think about this is that actually I was at, at, at the memorial of one devotee, and the whole community was there. Quite a well-known devotee. Uh, quite a long time member of a devotee, but not a very prominent, uh, uh, long time member of the devotee community, not a prominent devotee. So many devotees spoke very sincere appreciations of that devotee. And then the spiritual master of that community, at the end he spoke, hey, all of you spoke such heartwarming words of appreciation of this devotee, but how many of you had appreciated this devotee when he was alive? So if you had spoken this when he was alive, how much encouragement would you have got? So, 
I think appreciation is a small, it is an integral and a specific part of kindness. Of what you say being nice, you could just take that one step forward and appreciate. And if you make it a habit, we can actually become radiators of warmth. And ultimately, you could say the universe is reciprocal. If we appreciate someone, that person may not appreciate us, but somebody else will appreciate us. Now, I have that experience. Sometimes I prepare for a whole class very, very, very exhaustively. And at the end of the class, nobody appreciates it. But sometimes, some other days, I'm just tired or I'm too busy. I don't get much time to prepare for the class. And I give the class. And after that, somebody just appreciates it. It's just such a life-changing class for me. Really? I said, my life has not changed in the world. What happened? <laughs> I feel, I didn't do anything. So, in sometimes, uh, the, see, basically, there is a correspondence in the universe between what we give and what we get. But it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, I may give here and I may get there. But what happens when I give here, I keep expecting here. And even if somebody else is giving somewhere, I don't even look at that person. So, if we understand that actually, when I'm appreciating this person, I'm not just appreciating this person, I'm appreciating Krishna. Krishna is manifesting this person, Krishna is guiding this person, Krishna is empowering this person. And it's whatever good they are doing, it's Krishna is doing to them. So, if we see that connection with Krishna also, then what we are appreciating is a small manifestation of Krishna in this world. This person has good singing ability, all ability comes from Krishna. We sang with very nice kirtans. So then we are appreciating that person, we are also appreciating Krishna. And that Krishna whom we appreciate, Krishna will send appreciation to someone to us. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Thai Gaur Prema